Hello there, welcome back to The Closet Historian. Today I'm going to talk to you all about hats. That's right, it's time to delve into a subject I'm often asked about, especially when it comes to my straw hats or little small hats. Number one question there being how I keep them on my head. We're going to cover all of that kind of thing here today in this video. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the history of hat etiquette and the history of hat styles, things like that, just a bit in the beginning of the video. Go into my collecting strategy, some of the hats that I have, um, what I look for when it comes to shopping for hats, how I care for my hats, how I keep them on my head, all those things I will cover in this video today. So let's jump right in. So when I made a similar video to this all about gloves and my policies and uh, opinions about collecting and wearing gloves, I uh, will put a card up to that video here as well. I did uh, go into a couple of etiquette guides that I was able to find from the mid-century, sort of contemporary etiquette guides for wearing and um, for wearing gloves, how to pair them with things, things like that. Unfortunately, I found it a lot harder this time to find similar contemporary mid-century 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s guides from the time about what hats to wear when, um, or pairing hats, caring for hats, hat etiquette in general. Um, it seems that hat etiquette guides from the 40s and 50s are more geared towards men. So it's all about like when to take your fedora off or when to like doff your cap to different people and what levels of society had to doff their cap to who and when your hat was taken off and things like that. But most of the time these um, hat guides where they're detailing all the different things for men at the end will just say for ladies hats, ladies keep their hats on. And this was because most of the time ladies hats, especially in the 19 like 30s and 40s and then through the mid 50s perhaps, the hats are often like pinned into your hairdo. Um, they maybe have a veil or other little things that are like tucked into the hair that make them hard to remove. It's not like just pulling your fedora off like it was for men. So women's hats were much more considered part of the ensemble, part of the outfit, and part of the whole planned overall look. And so she was not expected to take her hat off because it's it's part of the outfit, darling. You couldn't, couldn't just be removing, you know, 25% of the outfit. That's just silly. Um, especially when it was something that was like, might be different or um, difficult architecturally to put back on again, um, just depending on how many pins and things required to get the, the darn thing to stay on your head. Um, there were some fanciful hats in the 40s and Man, am I a fan of them. Um, they called them sometimes toy hats or tilt hats or like whimsies or a different kind of hat. And these are all fanciful names for fanciful hats because they, uh, the thing about hats is you can really do anything. And there's some hats from a designer called um, Bez Ben. I'll put a couple of pictures here that really are quite wild. Um, so you can have anything from a very traditional or very feminine hat to, you know, I don't know, toys on your head basically, um, which is quite fun. So the nice thing about hats is that you can go as hard or as fanciful or as simple as you should like. But the main takeaway I got from looking into hat etiquette for women in the mid-century-ish zone is that they would keep their hats on and that there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of very uh, damning hat etiquette. The only time you would take your hat off is if you were wearing something like a winter hat and you came back indoors, you would take a hat like that off. Or if you're wearing a hat like maybe in the garden, just a sun hat sort of a thing, not part of your outfit per se, but more of a hat to guard against weather or the sun, you would take that kind of a hat off when you came inside. But other than that, most of the time ladies kept their hats on. Now, while I did find it difficult to find, say, etiquette guides on this for some reason, I'm sure there are some books out there and magazines out there that do have etiquette guides in them. Even the Emily Post Institute usually has good etiquette guides and I couldn't even find anything with them. They had a very short, short article on their website basically saying, ladies keep their hats on unless they're wearing a baseball cap, in which case you take it off, which doesn't seem like mid-century advice to me. Um, but while there was not very much etiquette information I could find, I did find many booklets and um, articles and things like that about what hats to wear with your face shape. Now, things like this, and also people have asked me before here on this channel, like, how do you know what looks good on your body shape? How do you know to dress for your body? And things like this, or like what makeup to wear for your coloring, what colors to wear for your coloring, all that kind of rules stuff that's like very rigid, like, oh, well, you should never wear red, or you could never wear a wide brim hat, things like that. I don't really subscribe to those kinds of things. I think if you find something you love, let's say you find a hat, or you inherit a hat, or you just really love a hat, I say, even if you know, you're know you not supposed to wear that hat with a heart-shaped face or whatever, do it, do it anyway. Um, I don't, I don't think, I think possibly the reason I have such a hesitance with these sort of guides is that I don't like the idea that there is one ideal sort of balance or look like an idealized form of beauty. I think that, you know, a, a square shaped face with a square shaped hat or whatever you're not supposed to wear. Sure, it doesn't mean not look how the 40s said you were supposed to be balanced, but I don't think that doesn't mean that you can't be beautiful and that you can't enjoy wearing something. So I guess I just have a hesitation when it comes to 
rules and guides like that where it's like, well, with knees like yours, you could never wear a skirt like this. Or with your kinds of like shoulders, you could never wear this jacket. Or with this face shape, you should never wear this hat. I don't really like that kind of rigidity. And I feel like it is old fashioned in a way I'm not comfortable with. But if this is, I mean, a lot of people I know still are very um, conscious of something flattering them in the more traditional sense. I say, if you like it, I don't think you have to care if it flatters you, according to Emily Post. Uh, you know, it doesn't, you know, you're, we're not being judged by Vogue editors walking down the street, especially not Vogue editors from 1943. So you wear what you like, but there are guides out there for those of you who are interested in knowing, well, like, you know, I have an oval face, what kind of hat should I avoid? I almost think it's the arranging of the hair around a hat can be done to balance this out too. So like if you have a tall hat and a long face and it's just gonna make everything even more long according to these sort of guides, you know, wear your hair curlier out to the sides and maybe you can fix or like readjust the balance because of how you arrange your hair with your hat. So I think there are things you can do to combat, you know, the wrong hat for your face shape and things like that. But I won't be going into that because I just find it a bit, I don't know. I think it's kind of rude to say you can't wear this style of hat because your face is this shape and it's not allowed. And it's like, I'm gonna wear what I want. I don't, I don't even know what kind of face shape I have. For those of you who ascribe to this kind of thing, let me know what face shape I have in the, in the comments below. However, I do still believe in balance and I do understand, I guess, the root of where this is coming from, creating a, you know, if you, from the neck up, creating a balance with the hat, with the shape of the bone structure and things like that. Like, I understand, I just think that I don't, even though I understand why there are rules, doesn't mean I think you need to follow them, which is the same for what I'm about to talk about now, which is the way a shape of a hat or the style of hat will balance with the rest of your outfit. So let's say you're wearing a full skirt, you can wear that with a larger hat or with a very small close kind of hat, um, or really with whatever kind of hat you want. But those were the se seems to be the two, like say in the 50s, the, either hats were quite close or hats were kind of like stretched out and um, almost like a shell kind of shape. So when you are choosing a hat, I do think you should consider the overall silhouette of something. If you have like a, like usually you do this when you are doing um, outfits. So let's say you have a very like bulky large skirt. Usually you won't wear a bulky large blouse with that. Usually you wear something slimmer. So balance uh, and proportion are to be kept in mind in general. But again, I just think that these kind of rules are made to be broken. I'm not, um, I think you, fashion is supposed to be fun. And that is my number one thing I wish to impart and that rules, I just don't think there's that much room for rules in fashion, especially when they have been used to sort of restrict people in the past. And I think that's just not the right way to go about it, darling. One of the main ways I do use hats to create balance in an ensemble is with color. So usually, as I'm always talking about here on this channel, I will wear matching color accessories. Sometimes I will wear like half one color and half another color, but often I will wear like a one particular dress, either solid or print, and I will wear a hat, belt, bag, shoes, all in the same color. And what that does, it kind of makes it so that your eye travels down or up the outfit in a very like pleasing, balanced way. So using the way that the eye reacts to an image, or in this case, a moving image, you, in your outfit, uh, I think it's nice to have your hat and your belt and your shoes definitely match because what it does is it makes the eye travel up through the outfit or down through the outfit in a very pleasing way, like lands on that color, you know, those in that separated way. And it's a very proportioned and balanced way to create an outfit. Um, so that is something I do really, I, that's, that's a rule I do follow, I guess, within my own fashion sense, but it's not something I think everyone has to do. And it's just a personal choice that I make usually to match my accessories so that the eye travels around the outfit in this way. Now, when it comes to the history of hats, hats go back a very long ways, but let's say we'll start here, like just in the, the 1920s a little bit. So we can, I'll show you a couple of images of what hats looked like in the 20s. Of course, the cloche or cloche hat was extremely popular, either with a close, very uh, no brim, basically, or a small brim, or also with a wider brim. But usually the hats fit down quite low over the head and come quite low on the forehead. Um, that's kind of the hallmark of 20s hats. And they all do have quite a similar shape, especially when you look at hats from the later periods, which are so very different. So hats from, you know, one year in the 40s, I'll show you a page of a 40s catalog here, um, even though I'm jumping ahead, where it shows you how many different styles are available just on one page of a catalog for one year. So the 20s had very homogeneous hats, like all of the hats, although they could be different fabrics, finishes, embellishments, things like that, the shape, the general overall shape is usually quite similar and worn quite low on the head over the forehead. Um, 1930s hats, they started to have a little bit more fun. There are definitely some surrealist hats here, especially with people like Scaparelli and um, Salvador Dali collaborating on some hats and things like that. 
but generally 30s hats have, are a lot more tilty, come, start coming in different shapes. I'll show you some more images here of 1930s hats. You get a little bit more fun in the 30s with hats, and then into the 40s is where it really goes uh, above and beyond, uh, mostly because of rationing during the war. You may not have been able to have another coupon to buy another hat, but maybe you could make something with some like yarn at home, or you could glue some toys onto something and like make that very avant-garde, or you could wrap a scarf into a turban, which is a very common thing to do in the 1940s. So 1940s hats, I think, are like the peak fun level. I mean, I guess 60s had some crazy like vinyl things going on, but I think 1940s hats, again, I really am quite biased because I love the 40s, but I think 1940s hats kind of take the cake when it comes to like silly little toy hats or like miniaturized Victorian hats, a lot of great things going on in the 40s, but also like sailor style straw hats and cartwheel straw hats are very popular in the 40s, um, as well as little toy and kind of cocktail hats and veiling, things like that. So 1940s had some pretty amazing hats going on. And then in the 1950s, this is kind of when hats first begin to drop out of style. Of course, in the first half of the 50s, they're very much in style still, but this is when it became more appropriate, more and more appropriate to go without a hat, I should say. Um, so it wasn't like as scandalous to be out of the house in the late 50s without a hat. It was much more common to see that sort of thing. But these kind of close styles in like felts and silks were very popular as well as larger brimmed hats still too. You'll notice in my own hats that I wear that I don't wear a lot of head size hats. I usually wear hats where the band size inside the um, hat is smaller than head size. Head size would be the measurement around your head here. I will try and find a graphic that shows you how to measure for your head size or your hat size. But for me, I usually wear hats that are smaller than head size, so I don't even have to worry about size. And they will just perch on top of the head or at an angle, things like that. So I don't usually wear head size hats, but those were definitely also a thing in the 40s and 50s. I just don't tend to go for that style personally myself. And moving into the 60s, we get to a period where I know less about, of course. There are some very fun, big, you know, those Jackie O big pillbox hats, um, some very fun flower, floral, crazy hats, almost like shower cap kind of styles of hats, um, wide brim and also tiny hats still. The 1960s still had a lot of very fun hats going on. Um, and even the 70s still had some fun hats and even the 80s still had some fun hats, but it's definitely just starts trickling off after the 1950s. Hats became uh, much less of a requirement for an ensemble. Definitely not something that was always expected to be seen out and about. Um, same with gloves, really. They sort of trickled down after the after the 1960s, both started becoming quite less popular, um, especially because that was when youth culture started taking off too, and the youth had never really been um, strictly, as, ever since like the 50s, they were not really encouraged necessarily to always have a hat and gloves and things like that as much. So uh, as youth culture began to dominate pop culture in general, that is another thing like where formal clothing kind of went out of style. So as like youth culture and denim and band t-shirts, things like that came into more prominence, of course, formal things like hats and gloves fell out of prominence. So you can kind of see a cultural shift in fashion as well here, but I usually focus on the 30s, 40s, and 50s anyway, so that's where my hat collecting is kind of rooted. I do want to show you some of my own hats from my collection, so I'll take you through a little bit of a small chronological selection of my hats, starting with this little velvet hat that I believe is from the 1930s. This is from a brand called, or a department store called I Magnin, I think is the name of this. Uh, it's very, you'll see this label a lot in collecting vintage hats and um, anything really. It was a very big department store in I believe San Francisco from the uh, like end of the 19th century into the 20th century. And I think they didn't, like they went through the 20th century quite a lot too. But this hat just has the kind of hallmarks of 1930s little style tilted berets in my opinion. I just think that this one, the quality of the rayon and the way it's sewn together and the way it sort of sits on the head, very feel very like Bonnie Parker or 1930s to me. And then my other 30s hat I want to show you is a later 30s one, but this is something I see a lot in, when I started reading Marsha Hunt's book, The Way We Wore, which I completely recommend this book. I love this book, I think it's great course it is no longer in print. I got my copy uh, used on Amazon. This is a um, discharged like library copy from some library, I forget which, but this book, if you can find it used, I would definitely pick it up. Great style inspiration. And you see a lot in the 30s. This is the first time I noticed when I was started reading this book, but in the 30s, now I see it all the time, of women wearing these white straw or white little tilted hats like this. And it seemed to be such a common style, and yet I see them so rarely in the vintage market. So when I saw this ivory colored straw hat in this very distinctive 1930s shape. I snapped it up lickety split and I got this hat for only $25. Now the inside band is quite stained. This is usually like sweat stains or makeup stains that have come off someone's forehead. 
that kind of thing. I know if you are a germaphobe, which usually I am too, but not when it comes to hats, um, could be disconcerting, but you have to remember it's sweat from 60 years ago. It probably can't affect you anymore. It should be okay. It's got more, you should worry more about the dust going on in these sort of items, but I know it's, there's a line for everyone there and some people don't like collecting antique items um, or vintage items. For me, I was just so ecstatic to find this hat. It's such an iconic style and yet so hard to find, which is really odd. I wish more people would make hat blanks in this sort of shape because it sits on the head quite well. And I was just so, so pleased to find this 1930s hat in quite good condition. The outside looks quite impeccable in my opinion. And I love wearing it in the summertime with my 19, more 1930s outfits and um, like dresses and things like that. Next, moving on to a 1940s hat. I would call this almost like a toy fedora. It seems to be kind of playing on more of a menswear sort of hat shape. This one is in black felt and does have a little moth nibble on the top of the crown of this hat, unfortunately, but it was such a cute little classic 1940s style. I will put images, both of me wearing this hat. I wore, I, often I times because this hat is plain, I will tr trim it, like I will pin on extra flo like flowers for the day or stick feathers on it, just depending on what I'm wearing. So I will wear this hat plain if I'm going for a more structured look, or sometimes I will pin flowers to it, pin feathers to it, put a veil over it. So I find this is a very versatile style for me, and I was really happy that I added this, this to my collection quite early on in my hat collecting. This next hat is a striped silk 1940s vintage hat with a veil on it as well. It's kind of like a combination of a boater slash toy hat slash almost Victorian-ish shape, only miniaturized. I don't know. I don't know what you would call exactly this style of hat. I'm not really good with hat names as we are learning here in this video, but I think it is just adorable. I love that it's rainbow stripes, of course. We know I love a rainbow thing or two for many reasons, but uh, this hat, of course, because of that rainbowness, does match nearly everything. And I do tend to wear it more in the fall and winter for whatever reason, although I do think you can wear a silk hat year round, which is kind of one of the nice things about hats in silk because Wool, of course, lends itself to fall and winter, straw to spring and summer. But a silk hat like this, I think, is much more year-round appropriate, and it does match nearly everything, this one. So I was so happy to pick it up and add it to my collection. It was quite an expensive hat for me. This one was, I think, around $85. I had it on my, like, favorites list, like my watch list, for the longest time before finally biting the bullet and purchasing it and adding it to my collection. It was an investment for me, but it's been a worthwhile one so far, and I do really adore this hat. And this next hat is another one I do believe is from the 1940s, although this one could be a little bit earlier, actually, just because it seems to be such a, such a, uh, of such fine quality, I can't speak anymore, um, because this straw is just so finely arranged and braided, it's beautiful, and the Petersham ribbon on this is a really nice little simple accent as well. I have pinned flowers to this hat before as an accent as well. That's always nice about having hats that are not overly trimmed, because you can always pin extra trimming on trimmings on them, depending on your ensemble, and then remove those and wear it in a different way the next time. So that's a nice thing about hats as well. But this straw hat has served me so well. I'll be putting images here on the screen of different times I've worn this one. Normally I wear it with 1940s things, but I've worn it in a more 30s way. I've worn it in a more 50s way. I think hats like this, this shallow crowned cartwheel, platter, pancake, whatever you want to call this style hat, you know, wide, boater, small, I, you know, there's, I've heard them in some portrait hats. I've heard them called so many different things and I'm not exactly sure what this shallow crown large hat is supposed to be called. I think cartwheel, cartwheel hat is the like best description I've heard of this one because it seems to only apply to hats like this. Whereas I've seen picture hats described as something different. I've seen pancake hats described as something different. So this seems to be a cartwheel hat. If you feel like correcting me, please feel free to do so in the comments below. But I love this style of hat. If you've been here or on my blog, you know, I have a a lot of this style and I really like investing in these ones. They are great for a wide range of different outfits. The next hat I have to show you is this similar, in some ways, larger straw shallow crowned hat, but this one I think is more from the late 40s into the 1950s. It has a bit of a domed or shell kind of shape to a very similar otherwise hat. Shallow crown, straw-ish, this one's more of like a sizal, kind of very, very fine straw material, but it has this little bit more of a domed shape and I'll try and show some images of other hats like this from the 1950s, which is why I am putting this one around that date. Also the more like almost Juliet cap kind of style inside of this hat that keeps it under your head, I think just makes it seem a little bit more 50s to me. You know, a lot of times when you're buying vintage fashion, it doesn't, it's not like things come with a date stamped on them or with a story usually. So it's hard to be able to date things sometimes. So you just kind of have to do research and use like context clues of other images that you see to kind of place your hat, jewelry, 
item, whatever, in the time it is from. So this one seems a little bit more 50s to me, and I wanted to show you the difference between that last straw hat and this one. A very common style in the 1950s were these close little felt hats. I actually do have some of these in a like fine straw. They come in straw, felt, fabric, lace, velvet. Um, these little close hats are a very um, like typical 1950s style. They seem to be worn with suits, skirts, uh, you know, dresses, all kinds of things were worn with these little close hats. And they are quite nice because they're quite close to the head. You don't have to worry. They clamp onto the hair um, and the head quite well. You don't have to worry about them flying off the wind because they don't have a brim that kind of catches wind like a sail on your head. So these nice little close hats offer a very polished and like finished look to an outfit without having to have this elaborate structure going on on your head. So they are nice. And they also remind me of Carol. So that's kind of why I have an extra affinity for these hats now. And I don't have very many of them. I would like to collect more, especially in this kind of classic felt like this um, for fall and winter because I do live in a place where it gets quite cold and it's nice to have a little, little piece of wool on my head to keep me a little bit more warm when I'm dashing from the car into wherever the heck I'm going. Um, so I do like these little close felt hats. I have a couple in straw as well, but I do need to collect more 50s hats. I have a lot more like almost late 30s, 40s hats than I do 50s hats. And I have quite a lot of 1950s-ish clothes, so it would be good to have more 50s hats in my collection, so an area of opportunity for my collecting in the future. And the only actually 60s hat I have is this one. This also could be from the late 50s as well. Again, don't know the exact date, but this is much more of that larger pillbox shape. It's done with a um, velvet covered wire is what makes the structure of this hat. I'll show you the inside here. You can see how the structure is made and then the flowers and veiling are added to the outside, of course, of this structure. This Velvet covered wire was a very common way of making hats all the way from the 30s through the 60s for sure. Um, I've seen it in older hats. I've seen it in 60s hats. So this was a very common way of making hats and easy way to make hats also for those who wanted to make hats at home or as a home milliner. Basically, you could make hats out of this velvet covered wire. I actually know of a hat making shop here in Denver that still sells the velvet tubing that you can put wire into, which is pretty cool. They have a lot of very old millinery supplies which is so fun as a seamstress to check out. And actually, though I have had this hat in my collection a very long time, I have never managed to figure out exactly how to wear it. So what do you think I should wear with this hat? I don't wear a lot of 60s fashion. I think that's part of the reason I never quite figured out, but I like the idea that it was sort of a vintage flower crown in some ways. So, you know, maybe I just need to go to a festival and wear it with my mom jeans and it would be quite the look, no? So that's a small selection of my hats showing you a few different styles from the 30s, 40s, and 50s into the 60s a little bit there at the end. I do not have any 20s hats in my collection, sadly. Um, hats, because they are so close to the body in many ways, they are exposed to like the oils from your hair, the oils from your skin, things like that. So sometimes they don't last forever and hats are fragile as well. You, you know, it's very easy to sit on a hat and ruin it, um, things like that. So I can imagine that's why it's rarer to get 20s and 30s hats still, but it's rare to get 20s and 30s anything when it comes to vintage fashion as well. So it's hard to find replicas too. So if only more people out there were making deco things, and I'm sorry if that is your area of focus because I really have no recourse or recommendations to you on where to get hats like that. And you're just gonna have to do some deep diving research, I'm afraid. Now, while I don't really know the names for many hat styles and things like that, I don't really ever focus on collecting very specific named styles and things like that. I kind of just know what I like and buy what I like. Again, not focusing on if it will look good with my face shape or whatever. I just I just buy what I like and hope that I like it when it gets to me because we know how much online shopping I do. But if you would like to learn more about specific hat styles, what they were called and specific hat styles from each era, I will link in the description below three different posts from the website Vintage Dancer. This is a very amazing resource. I've recommended it here on the channel before. This website is very good, especially if you're new to vintage style about looking at different specifics. So if you're interested in just 1940s shoes, if you're interested in some men's style from the 1930s, if you're interested in 1950s aprons, all these kinds of things, this website will have individual articles on usually breaking down the styles. And it definitely is true of hats. So I will link to their 30s, 40s, and 50s hat style guides so you can learn a little bit more about the styles from each of those eras and what they're called and things like that. Of course, other additional resources can be found by searching on Pinterest, everyone's favorite, you know, image search website pretty much at this point. And I do love collecting images of hats or just editorial images in general. So I can see like, how do you know what hat to wear with what? I'm sure there were a lot of guides at the time. And sometimes in like a vintage catalog, it will say, wear this with your 
blah, 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 like as a suggestion trying to get you to buy the hat, but it's actually very useful for us now when they're like, wear this with your winter wools. And you're like, great, that's what I know what to wear that hat style with now. I wish there were more guides like that. I'm sure in vintage fashion magazines there must be, but I just couldn't find any scans for us this time, unfortunately. But um, another, speaking of scans, good resource are catalogs. So anytime you see vintage images, catalogs, fashion plates, patterns, images from fashion magazines, uh, anything, films, anything like that, where you see an entire ensemble, just to take note of the type of hat and what it's being worn with. Like, it's hard to find like a list of like, oh, if you're wearing a gray suit, wear this kind of hat, or here are your options. It's hard to find something like that, but you can just take note when you are researching anything, any other, when you're researching clothes, jewelry, whatever you are looking into specifically, um, when you're researching vintage style, the period of your choice, take a look at what kind of hats people are wearing with what. And that's just kind of how you're gonna have to absorb the visual language of that time and figure out what you would like to pair with each of your outfits as well. Now, when it comes to buying vintage hats, of course, I buy my hats on Etsy, eBay, in person, usually at like vintage fairs or vintage um, like antique malls, things like that, vintage stores. I don't often get to vintage stores very much because we just don't have very many here in Denver, but if I'm like in LA or something, I might find a hat at a vintage shop. Um, and then I've never seen them out thrifting uh, the, the hats that I see when I am thrifting tend to be not true vintage hats. And anytime I have seen like a 1950s hat, it's like thrashed beyond belief because it's been in someone's like play clothes box for years and it's usually thrashed. So if you have good hat thrifting in your area, consider yourself quite blessed. But mostly I've collected my hats by buying them off of Etsy and eBay as well. I have had more hat luck on eBay for whatever reason than I do with anything else. That's usually the one place, like the one thing I get from eBay, weirdly enough, is hats. Um, but that's just where I found some of my bigger straws over time. So check out eBay and Etsy as well if you are an online shopper like me. And when it comes to buying the correct size of hat, again, I don't really buy head size hats. I do have some that are a size 22, which is what I think I'm a 22 and a half is my head size. Um, so you do just measure like around, figure out what that cranium uh, needs. And then you have to allocate, like if you have big hair, you might need a larger hat size. Um, or if you plan to wear your hair quite big, you might need a larger size hat to fit over all that hair. Um, but, uh, I, though be, I am a 22 and a half size head size. I usually buy hats that are smaller and just pin them, perch them onto my head. I don't really buy close fitting hats. Uh, just not a style I prefer for myself for whatever reason. So it's not something I worry about too often, but if you like hats that are more of a head size, then I can see how shopping for them would be a little bit more difficult. Um, shopping online would be a little bit more difficult than it is for me because of course, when I'm buying hats that have a small crown, they fit anybody. So that's kind of the nice things about, one of the nice things about smaller or, or toy sized hats is that you just pin them on, you know? You don't have to worry about what size they are. They're, they're fun size, literally. Now, when it comes to what am I paying for hats, this is a very wide varying thing. Um, this weekend I was at the vintage market and I got a really nice, very great condition, 1950s, simple gray felt hat for $6. Um, no moth holes, anything, it's in perfect condition for $6. And I was very jazzed to have a new hat for this price of a grande Starbucks. However, I have paid $85 for a hat. I paid $115 probably is max. Ooh, there was a firework outside of my window just then. I have paid um, like up to probably $115 for like a really nice big straw hat with like trimmings before. So that's kind of the range I stick between, you know, $5 and $105. Um, I try, I don't spend on the higher end of that anymore just because I can't afford to. There was a time when I was making a little bit more money and I felt I could invest in a couple of hats, so I did, but um, the more rare the stock, like the more rare and better condition of style, the more expensive it's going to be. And that's just, you know, how all vintage is really. But that's, I, I would think in general, my, my general range of price for a hat, I would think is somewhere between 25 and $45 is what I am always looking to pay. Um, over that I consider an investment, but sometimes I spring for them under that I consider a great deal. So that's kind of the general price range I am paying when I, when I am collecting hats. Now, how do I store all of my hats? I actually have a couple of large boxes from Ikea. They're just like card paper, or like cardboard boxes. I would like to get archival acid-free boxes sometime, but these sort of museum quality boxes that are the best for storing clothes, hats, accessories in are more expensive. So I just can't afford to invest in them just yet. I can, however, get acid-free tissue paper and I have, and I just wrap each hat in tissue paper or like stuff the insides of tissue paper, lay a um, layer of tissue between each hat. And then I just sort of stack them and arrange them lightly in larger boxes. Um, or if I have like a large, usually, um, Boxes that boots come in are pretty good for hat boxes as well. Again, try and use acid-free if you can, but I know it's just not possible all the time to upgrade your storage like that. 
Um, I like to keep my hats in boxes, not out on display because of course they do get dusty. Now, a solution for a dusty hat uh, I have found, especially straw hats because they're quite hard to clean um, without damaging them, is the compressed air that you use to clean your keyboard or things like that. I don't know if you've seen those canned air. Those work quite well as long as you like don't get them too close. You're not getting like the actual cold like freeze stuff that makes that canned air work. Probably flammable. Um, but you can use that to brush or like blast the dust off of your hats. So that's something that's a good hat cleaning tip if you have been storing your hats out and about and they're quite covered in dust now. Um, something that is better than, you know, taking a washcloth to it or something like that, which might damage the hat, is compressed air. That's my favorite hat cleaning tip. And when it comes to... We need to stop it with the fireworks outside, you guys. There's like fireworks going off outside. It's not July 4th, it's August 4th. They're a month late. Get, get it together, people. When it comes to cleaning other types of hats or cleaning wool hats, I do not have a lot of experience in this area. I'm sure that there are specialty cleaners, um, and I'm, by cleaners I mean like dry cleaners, people who know how to clean hats. It's very easy when you get a hat wet or, um, you know, to aggressively clean a hat and it will lose its shape. Um, hats can be reblocked if they are like a fedora, but something that's a small little 1950s, 40s hat could, you know, be very hard to um, repair if you actually uh, get it wet or things like that. So I always err on the side of just buying cleaner hats. If I find a great hat out at the antique mall, but it's just filthy, I leave it behind because I know I'm not the right person to kind of restore that sort of thing. I'm sure there are experts out there. I am just not one of them. So this is another area where I just have a set rule with myself. If something is very dirty, I just won't buy it and I don't get my hats dirty once I have them in my collection. So, you know, don't drop your hat in the mud. It's a pretty easy, you know, recommendation, but one that should be followed. The only kind of repair I will do to hats is through just like replace the hat elastic because like sometimes hats will have little tiny elastics to hold them onto your head and I will replace a hat elastic if it's become stretched out because that's an easy fix. Um, possibly even re putting a new ribbon on the inside of the hat if, I, if one's like totally destroyed and that's the only thing wrong, I would totally do that. Fixing the trimmings, like if something has really deflated sad flowers, I'll just take them off and put new flowers onto a hat. Um, or if something has a veiling that has lots of tears. Um, sorry, there's fireworks outside. And I keep getting shocked by them. Um, if veiling has lots of tears or rips in it, sometimes I'll just take the veil off. Sometimes I'll replace the veil. And sometimes if it's like a main component of the design is the veiling. And I know I won't be able to find a veil like that anywhere else because it's hard to find vintage veiling for hats um, as well. I will just not buy that hat. Sometimes I just, you know, I want it very badly but I know I'm not the one to repair it, so I will just pass up on them. So those are the kind of fixes I'm used to doing or expect to do when it comes to buying vintage hats. Again, everyone's gonna have their own sort of preference on how soiled they think is too soiled for a hat. Uh, some of my hats, as you saw, have some makeup soiling on the hat band. To me, I mean, it's gross if you think about it, but I just try not to think about it, <laughs> pretty much. I'm willing, as long as the outside of the hat is flawless, if the inside, let's say, of the lining was really stained, I might replace the lining, I might replace this hat band on these kinds of things, but makeup stains don't really bother me too much. Um, that's just my personal preference when it comes to hats. I know for some people that would just be like way too gross. I know there's some people who don't wanna wear antique or vintage hats at all. And I find that totally understandable because I'm a bit of a germaphobe myself. I don't know why I have a blind spot in this area. I guess I just love hats more than my germaphobic tendencies. Um, so it's just outweighing my usually cringe self um, because I just love hats so much that I'm willing to look past it, but I know everyone's gonna have their own kind of line to draw here on where they find hats too dirty to wear or too old or things like that. But for me, um, I would rather, I mean, for some reason I would never like wear used shoes. That would bother me, but hats I'm fine with. I don't know, you know, everyone's got their own quirks and perhaps that's just one of mine. I don't mind used hats. I don't know, I, it's just something I uh, don't really concern myself with, oddly enough. Now, the moment you have all been waiting for here on this channel. How the heck do I keep the hats on my head? How do I wear my hats? How? Well, some hats have usually smaller hats and also some of my larger ones have little combs sewn onto the inside of the hat. So sometimes there'll be little combs sewn to a bit of elastic that you can kind of stick into your um, hair or into your, yeah, like into your hairdo. Um, often people will ask me like, how do you get hat pins and get hats to stay on your head? And it's partially because my hair is set and it's got hairspray in it, it's got some, maybe some teasing in it. It creates a very good base to pin into, to clamp onto. So when your hair is done, 
like natural freshly washed hair is very smooth and slippy. There's nothing for the hat to stick to there, but because my hair has a little bit of hairspray in it, has curl to it, there's a lot more grip or for the hat to grip onto. This little hat I have actually on here, which is very much blending in with my hair. Um, this is a like 1950s or oh, 60s style hat, very common little style here. It, here it's done with like almost two banana like curved shaped sections of wire and a hat like this it just kind of clamps because it has memory in the wire it just sort of clamps on to the head and it's not it's not really going anywhere it would have to be some fierce wind or fierce dancing to knock this off if i were to dance which would never happen but i sh assume some of you do dance i would pin this hat on further or like put some bobby pins into it or something but how i keep hats on my head if they don't have an elastic if they don't have combs built into the design these guys Hat pins. These are actually quite long hat pins. Uh, I prefer the shorter ones and actually I am out of them. I broke my last favorite one because I dropped it on the tile in my bathroom and the pin of it shattered. So I just actually invested in some and they are not here yet. Um, one of those things I really don't like buying actually hat pins because like the little practical kind, obviously like pretty hat pins I wouldn't mind buying, but the little like practical glass head hat pins, I'll put an image here of the ones that are on their way to me now. These I don't really like buying because I'd much rather save my money and buy a hat. But, you know, these are the practical things one needs as a vintage fashionista, hat pins. But some people are like, okay, great, hat pins. But how? What? What do you do with that? Do you pin it straight into your skull? Like, what is the deal? Um, and the secret with hat pins is you're going to pin it through the hat and kind of scoop up. You're going, if you imagine there's a hat here, or this is the hat, you're going to pin it through the hat, scoop up some of the hair underneath, and then it pin back out through the hat so that the part of the hat pin has is like attached to your hair so your hair is being pinched between the hat and the hat pin and that secures the hat quite well to your head i will pin on one of my straw hats on camera for you here and insert the clip here so you can see what i mean by this it's hard of course because you, i can't show you the underside of the hat and the overside of the hat and underneath my hair you're just gonna have to trust me like you pin through the hat scoop up like i kind of pin until i feel the pin hit my scalp yeah, I said it. You're going to get poked. Um, and then you kind of just scoop up some hair down here. I'll see. You scoop up some hair and then stick it back out up through the hat. So you've kind of pinched some of your hair to the hat and it helps keep it on. Again, this is not going to work if you have silky, straight, freshly washed hair. If you have some product in your hair, if you have some curl to your hair, if your hair is set and pinned, has combs in it even, that gives it a lot more structure to pin into. And that is how my hats stay on my head. Of course, some of my straw hats because the head size isn't tiny, um, it's like not too, too far away, will stay on my head. Like a lot of times in my modeling clips where I'm like styling outfits for you, I don't bother to pin them on because I'm about to change anyway, um, just because I'm doing quick changes and things like that for the video. But um, these hats I would pin on before I like left the house, for example. And I just don't wear large straw hats if I know I'm gonna be out in the wind. If it's a very windy day, which does happen here in Denver, I just won't wear a large hat because no matter how many pins I stick in that thing, I'm afraid that the hat will get damaged because of the stress of trying to keep it on my head. And I just would rather not damage my hats. I would rather them not fly off and end up in the road, things like that. So I just won't wear them if it's really windy. People are always like, what do you do when it's really windy? I'm like, don't stand outside. I mean, it's really hard to get me to leave the house anyway. Um, so standing outside in the wind is just not going to happen. Wear a closer, smaller style of hat on a day like that. It's just my biggest recommendation. There's no need to wear a sail on your head when it's windy. You might end up flying, the hat might end up flying. It's just not a good idea, really. But yeah, that is my secret to keeping my hats on my head, hat pins. Um, I just think that many people are like, uh, while they may know of hat pins, they're not exactly sure how they are used. And that, that really is the secret, or at least how I use them. I stick them through the hat, scoop up hair, and then back up through the hat. And I find that I will sometimes need, you know, one on each side, one in the back, wherever I feel like, because of the way, the way my hair is arranged, I need the most like security anchored point to my head. That's where I will put a hat pin. I don't mind wearing, you know, two or three hat pins. I try and hide them, like, if there's, like, a ribbon, I'll hide them near the ribbon. Right next to the, like, where the crown and the brim meet is a good spot to hide hat pins if you don't want them to be quite seen. Of course, ones that are prettier, you don't really mind them being seen. But the smaller ones, you know, you can kind of hide them underneath the flower or underneath the ribbon, underneath the bow. So you can't really see how the hat is attached, but it is still secured on your head. That's how I wear my hats practically, but how do I wear them socially? That's right, out and about in the modern world wearing a hat. Now, most people don't wear hats anymore unless they're skiing um, or in the garden, 
But I do wear my hats out and about. I've worn them to the garden center. I've worn them to Target. I've worn them at the grocery store. I've worn them out to a garden, to restaurants. I've worn my hats everywhere. And guess what? You are going to get stared at. That is something that is just going to happen. People are not used to seeing hats anymore, especially dress hats, which is what I would call most vintage hats, are now considered to be dress hats. They're not a straw fedora you wear at the beach. They're not like a floppy beach hat. They're not a wool beret, which I think is possibly the best like bridge between vintage and modern hat, really, is a wool beret, because people are like, oh, a beret. They don't really get too jarred by that. But if you wear a 1940s tilt hat, everyone is going to stare at you, and you just kind of have to be okay with that, honestly. And I know that's not always easy, especially when you are new to vintage style, to accept that people are going to be looking at you when you're out and about. People will make comments. People will ask, are you in a play? Or are you dressed up for a particular reason? Are you going to a costume party? Things like that. You're going to get comments. Most of them are nice sometimes, especially with hats. Um, usually if you're wearing something pinuppy, you might get annoying comments. But usually hats, it's like, oh, I remember when my grandmother used to wear hats. And you're like, that's right. I want your grandma's style, you know. But uh, you are going to get stares if you wear hats out in the modern world. It's just part of the game, unfortunately. I think in places like New York or London, it's less strange, especially in the UK, because people still do wear hats for formal occasions in the UK. But here in the United States, it's just such a rarity that you're going to get stares. And so you kind of just have to make, make peace with that. And when it comes to getting your first vintage style hats or transitioning into building your hat wardrobe, I do recommend getting a wool beret first. I think it's a very good testing the waters of wearing a hat out and about because people are still kind of used to the idea of a beret. They might ask you if you just got back from France or something equally, you know, cheesy. But I do think a beret is a good kind of transitional hat for those who are new to wearing hats and you can wear them in quite different ways. I will also put a beret on my head and do a clip here because some people have asked me how do I put my berets on for they seem to like the way I've done it. I don't really know. This is just how I arrange them. Uh, it's kind of usually how I do it. Again, it just depends on how I've styled my hair that day. But uh, I quite, quite like berets. I have many different colors of them. I think it's a good place to start if you are newer to wearing hats and don't really want to be at getting too much attention while you're out and about because usually a beret is like the least attention drawing vintage hat style that's still vintage appropriate, I think. And then the other like main style I would say is a good place to start is straw hats for the summertime. You can find ones that are more of like a domed crown head size straw hat. You can find those at Target still, you know, it's not that unusual for a straw hat in the summertime. Um, people still will find it a bit unusual if you're not at the beach, but you know, you can be unusual if you should so desire to, which I mean, it's not like I desire to be strange by wearing hats. I just like hats and people categorize that as a strange thing to do. But again, nothing I can do to avoid this. Um, but I do think a shallow crown straw hat like perhaps this one is a good place to start. These ones I have been getting on Etsy by searching for 18th century straw hat. So if you are uh, looking for a good 1930s, 40s straw hat with this shallow crown, search for an 18th century hat because the same style works for both of those very disparate eras, funny enough. And then after that, I really think it does start to depend on which era of fashion you focus on. Um, if you're like me and you focus on 1940s style mostly, you're going to be wanting looking want to look for 1940s style hats. If you focus on the 50s, you're going to want to look for more 1950s styles, 20s, 30s, whatever era you are most interested in. You're going to want to do research on that sort of era and pick hat styles that you think are going to be really versatile for you in an era specific wardrobe. If you just like to bounce around and just like to buy what you like, buy what you like. It does not have to. I mean, if you want to wear a 20s hat with a 60s dress. It's going to be a, quite a cool just juxtaposition, especially because the 60s borrowed so much from 1920s fashion. If you want to wear a 50s hat with a 40s dress, I'm not going to be nitpicky. I don't think there are rules. Once again, I think fashion is meant to be played with. It's meant to be fun. So don't worry about mixing your eras if you should so desire to. If you want to have a completely accurate look, go for it um, from head to toe. If you want to have a eclectic look from head to toe, go for that too. It's all up to you. And that's kind of what defines your personal style. You know, how ac when it comes to vintage, People are like, you know, what is vintage style? Well, but everyone's vintage style is different. Some people are super accurate. Some people are very decade specific or like year specific. Some people are like, don't wear anything, you know, everything from 1930 to 35 and nothing outside of those bounds. Or some people like me might be 20s one day and 50s the next. So that's kind of where personal style becomes, you know, more of a thing is because of how you choose to rock the vintage that you like. That is where your style becomes personal and, you know, only yours. So those are my opinions and sort of my take on hats, wearing, collecting hats, things like that. If you feel I have missed anything, please feel free to ask me questions in the comments below. If you have any questions about specific hats of mine or specific 
pet questions, please leave those down there for me and I will try and answer to the best of my ability or point you towards a better resource where you may be able to find the answer you seek. And thank you as always for tuning in here today. I'll see you again real soon. Bye.